Everybody, I want to welcome you to Homeport. My name is Ben, I'm one of the pastors here. I get the opportunity to preach and teach, which is an amazing gift. Thank you. Um, like Jordan said, we, we did. We had an absolutely wonderful Easter weekend, right? I mean, packed with Good Friday, uh, our first Good Friday service with a, a wonderful uh, group that had come together. Again, thank you to our men's ministry who put that together and all the brave men who got up on stage and spoke in front of people. It's not an easy task, so we are just so thankful for that. Um, Good Friday, Sunday, we had a sunrise service. The, the weather was crisp, but, the, but it was beautiful. It was. I had, like, my puffer jacket on, and after I, like, stopped for a few minutes and was just sitting, I was cold. Like, it was just chilly, right? Uh, but it was beautiful, beautiful morning. Nobody got attacked by a geese. Most of the construction trucks were gone. God is good, right? Like, God is good. I don't know. Jordan had a wonderful message. Thank you again also to the guys who led us in worship that morning. Um, and then our 10 a.m. gathering was a packed house. Um, I, I, I was one of the, the funniest things from the whole weekend. We had such an amazing parking team. They parked everybody so well that there were still all kinds of parking in the back of the parking lot. <laughs> like they had them parked everywhere else but in the parking spots. They are, that's amazing, right? Like that took a lot of work. But, uh, but seriously, like, like that, was, that was really good. We had such an amazing volunteer team. I mean, across the board, we just had a wonderful, wonderful experience to be able to gather for worship that morning. Um, so just thank you to you all. Thank you to you guys. We couldn't do it without our volunteers um, who make this happen every single week. All right, now here's my big ask for you. This is my big, big, big ask. Every year, this time of year, we need camp volunteers. I need you to sacrifice a week of sleep to minister to the worst people in the world, <laughs> middle school students. Um, love them to death, but like, once, you, once you've hit that many hours with middle school students, it's only by the grace of God uh, that you walk out on Friday morning, you, you, you sing his praises, your hands are raised in hallelujahs. No, it, uh, I say all that in total jest. Uh, we have an amazing week of middle school camp and I would love to invite you, if you have a week of vacation or just the time to come and spend a week with us, we need dorm parents um, and game volunteers and um, just, just help all around. And if you would like to do that, you have that opportunity and would um, want to be a part of that, see Jordan and I, we can help you get uh, through the application process and all the, the steps that go with that. So um, we, are, we are gearing up for a great camp season. We've got high school camp coming. Well, actually, this year, elementary camp's the first week of camp, a high school week, a middle school week, and then some other great weeks um, beyond that as well. Um, so that's my pitch for, for camp volunteers. Again, I would love to have you be a part of our team. Uh, Jordan and I get to do this every year together uh, with some other uh, great youth ministers from around the state. All right, so we are nearing the end of our series in the book of Acts. We started back in the fall of last year, actually the end of summer last year. And we talked about the church embarking out. Like God, or Jesus has just raised, uh, in, ascended into heaven. He has given the church uh, the task to go be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the earth. And we talked about uh, what that looked like as they began to embark on this uh, gospel mission that they had been given in the first couple books of Acts. When we get into about Acts chapter 8, and the church is dispersed. They are sent out. There's persecution that comes, and they leave Jerusalem. And they, they get out of that world, and they begin to take the gospel into other parts of Israel and, and eventually around uh, the Roman world. And so we've been following through this book of Acts, a book we know written by a follower of Jesus named Luke. He wrote the gospel in Luke, the accounts of Jesus' life as he was trying to create this account for uh, another gentleman and, and share the gospel and the good news about what Jesus has done with him. And uh, he also... Uh, wrote the book of Acts and the spread of Christianity across the Roman world. About half of the book, maybe a little bit more of the book of Acts, is about one man and, and his missionary journeys, the, the Apostle Paul. 
And one of the places that we find the Apostle Paul time and time again is in front of a Roman official explaining who he is and what he believes and why he's not afraid to go to jail. It happens time and time and time again. And as we get into the end of the book of Acts, this is really the bulk of what we're going to see is Paul again before this magistrate and then this magistrate and then this king. And eventually he'll get to Rome where he will eventually be in front of uh, the emperor. And, and it's this that, that he is unafraid of what will come even though he's been whipped and beaten and chained for the gospel. And it got me thinking about how would we handle being arrested and thrown into jail for what we believe? What would we say when we were in jail? Would we keep our faith to ourselves because we don't want to get into more trouble? Or are we going to boldly proclaim the good news and tell others about Jesus and why we're in prison? Right? How would we handle it? What would we do if we were given the opportunity? It made me think there's a scene that I vaguely remember from my childhood in a Police Academy 4. And one of the guys in Police Academy 4 gets thrown into jail and he has one of those metal cups that only really exists in the movies because they don't really give people metal cups. I mean, that's a good, like, you know, you bash somebody with a good metal cup. But anyways, he's got this metal cup and he's running it up and down the bars. And this is me. I just, I'm going to say, you know, and he starts singing this old African-American spiritual hymn, right? Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus, right? Like, I, like that's what I feel like. We'd be in their jail singing these songs, uh, you know, trying to imagine what it would be like if we were in Paul's shoes. In the last few chapters, that's, that's what Paul is. He goes from one jail cell to another jail cell. He stays in one jail in uh, a Roman pr uh, palace prison in a city named Caesarea. He stays there for a little bit more than two years before he eventually sails to Rome and, and is put on house arrest there uh, until he dies. All right, we are in Acts chapter 24 and 25 this morning. I'm not going to read a bunch of it. Actually, I'm only going to read two verses out of it. Uh, it's the same story, it just twice. In Acts chapter 24, uh, Paul is before a governor named Felix. Uh, Felix <clears throat> is, uh, um, he's not very well loved by the Jews. And, uh, and so eventually he leaves uh, his post as governor, but to try and keep the Jews happy with him, he, he, he keeps Paul in prison for a little bit more than two years. And then another governor comes in named Festus, and Festus eventually gives him an appointment before King Agrippa, and, um, and then, who's one of Herod's grandsons, um, and then, which we'll talk about more next week. And then he, uh, and then eventually they send him on to Rome. But it's pretty much the same thing in 24 and 25. He gives his story to Felix. He gives his story to Festus. Uh, but in chapter 24, we see this really uh, interesting account of um, Paul give, being given the opportunity to speak to Felix and his wife, Drusilla. And, um, and they have this very, they're very interested in Christianity, which we'll see is called, they call the way. And the way is just an early name for Christianity, right? It's Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So early people um, called Christianity the way. Uh, so they had this very, they were very interested and actually very knowledgeable about the way it says. And during one of the times Paul is given an audience with Felix and his wife, he's asked to share about his faith in Jesus, and he takes the opportunity to share a message. And as I was looking through the text, as I was going through the text, and I was like, how do you preach through a narrative that really isn't filled with a lot? What do you take? And so this morning, it, it, I'm going to take what I hope, I, what I think may have been a portion of what Paul would have said and, and the way he would have preached this message to them. So turn with me in Acts chapter 24, right down to... Um, verse 24 and 25. This is what it says. It says, a few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Priscilla, who was Jewish, sending for Paul. They listened as he told them about faith in Jesus, as he reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control and the coming day of judgment. 
Now, it's interesting. It said, after he gets through his message, it says that Felix became frightened, right? Go away now, he replied, and when it's more convenient, I'll call for you again. Felix heard something in this message of righteousness and self-control and coming judgment that scared him, right? But as I think about these three things this morning, what would Paul have shared when he talked about his faith in Jesus, right? I'm sure he shared his story of encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus. He would have shared how the good news changed his life, how one day he was a a murdering Pharisee who was just completely bent on destroying the way to now being in chains, gladly being in chains for the gospel that he believed in, for the gospel that changed his life, right? He would have talked about how he could put his faith in the living Jesus, right? The one that we just celebrated this past weekend. He's not a dead savior. He's not a dead God of, of a, you know, of this faith that we believe in, but we believe in a living God, He is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is the risen Savior, right? He defeated death. He was given victory over death and the grave. These are the things that he would have talked about. And we could imagine that he would have shared the teaching of Jesus and how Jesus' ways changed the way that we live. And as he talked about his faith, he would have segued into this message about righteousness and self-control the coming judgment. Honestly, each of these really could be their own messages. I mean, these are huge topics to talk about the righteousness of God and and our righteousness, to talk about self-control and to talk about what is coming when Jesus returns. But Paul put them into three, so I'm going to try it myself. So, all right, when Paul talked about righteousness, what was he talking about? Righteousness in Paul's mind, first and foremost, would have come out of this idea of the righteousness of God. Who is he as a righteous God? And as you look across how that word is used in the Old Testament, the righteousness of God is found in his willingness to save his people over and over and over again, right? Righteousness is found first in God, and his righteousness and saving grace changes us And we are called to then live righteously among others. And you can fill in those two blanks if you'd like. This twofold righteousness, God's righteousness saves us. And it changes the relationship that we have with others. The way that we live as Christians will be different because of the righteousness of God and that righteousness that has been given to us. Romans chapter 1, or Romans chapter 6, sorry. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. This is what it says. It says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we joined with Christ in Jesus, or Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life with him. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of of sin. This is the righteousness of God, his saving nature towards us. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now he lives and he lives for the glory of God. So you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sins or sin, and alive to God through Christ Jesus. This is our righteousness. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not, let, do not give in to the sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve in sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, he says, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, 
Since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves to sins, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching that you were given. Now you are free from your slavery of sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. I think that when Paul was here and he was formulating this idea of this righteousness, this is, this is where it would have come from as he sat down later to write about righteousness in the book of Romans. This, this whole passage, you have to think he would have thought back to these messages that he was speaking and the way the Holy Spirit moved through him in these ways as he talked about righteousness when he wrote down these verses in Romans. We could see his thoughts on the righteousness of God and how God saved us and he removes us from slavery to sin and calls us to be his children, to be his people, right? But righteousness doesn't end there. It changes the way that we live. We stop living as slaves to sin so that we can be slaves to righteous living, right? He says, use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right. There's action in this. Use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. And when we think about all that Jesus has done for us, are we allowing that to change the way that we live? Does it change our life from the inside out? Are we using our time here on earth as followers of Jesus to, as an instrument to do what is right for God's glory? God's righteousness makes us righteous when we put our faith in Jesus but it's not a badge of honor that we wear on a puffed-up chest. It's a, it's a changed way of living. At our deepest levels, we are impacted by the gospel, and that gospel comes out of us as we live and treat others the way that God would want them to be treated. And because our actions here on earth bring God glory, we don't want to do things that take that glory away from him that he deserves. And this naturally kind of segues into this idea of self-control. If righteousness changes how we live, it makes sense that we would seek to control our old selves. Paul says we're no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteous living. So we want to have these changed relationships. We've got to learn to control ourselves. Galatians chapter 5 says, but the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. For Christians, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one fruit. It's like going up to a tree and pulling off the biggest apple, grape, pineapple, jackfruit you've ever held in your hand, right? Like, and then eating it and tasting every single one of them. When we talk about the fruits of the Spirit, that's exactly what is happening. The kind of fruit that we pull off the tree of the Holy Spirit produces in our lives is a fruit that is, has all the attributes of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Self-control is the ability, obviously, to control oneself, but it involves things like moderation and constraint and the ability to say no to these base desires and our fleshly lusts, right? Like, like that's self-control. It goes back to that idea of being a slave of righteousness in Romans chapter 6. Are we living with control when we look at our lives the way that we deal with people, or the things that happen in our lives. Are they controlled? Are, we, are they measured control in our lives, right? Is there moderation in the things that we do? Is there a constraint to us? The things that we don't say and the punches we don't pull, right? The ability to say no to our former self when it rears its ugly head back into our lives. When we think about what is self-control look like. One author said that self-control in the life of a Christian is like a defensive wall around a city. It's there to protect us from the things that we're trying to escape in the culture around us. It offers us protection because we're constantly being bombarded with this temptation 
to go back to our former ways. Right? Self-control is this defense. It helps us live the Christian life. Self-control is working hard to make money but not becoming greedy, right? For some, self-control is having a drink but not having too many to become drunk. It's having one spouse and not multiple spouses, right? Like this is self-control. It's watching the words that we use when we talk to others or the temptation we have to talk about others. It's the ability to live in this world, but not of this world. That's self-control. And often when we talk about living with self-control, it's said that our, our future selves will thank us, right? Like if we're, if we're eating healthy, if we're taking care of our body, like all the, the discipline, the time, the energy, and doing the things that we, we don't really like to do, because we can be honest, unless you're Jordan, you don't really like to work out and exercise. Um, but, but, Jordan's future self is going to thank him a whole bunch, right? Like, um, my future self, he's going to be a little mad at me. Um, but but, but the, that's, that's, I think, as he, as he turns the corner from righteousness and self-control into coming judgment, I think that's what he's trying to get across to Felix and Drusilla. Like, your future self is going to thank you because you heeded the gospel of Christ. You didn't find at judgment that you were on the wrong side of the Lord. God's righteousness saves us, not because we deserve it, because it, it comes from who he is and the love that he has for us as his greatest creation. He chose to save us from the coming judgment. His righteousness changes how we live and our relationships with others. The self-control that he offers um, is it's all super important to the future that is coming. Not allowing ourselves to live as slaves to sin uh, any longer is self-control at work in our lives. Like I said in Romans chapter 16, or we read, don't you realize that you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. That's the coming judgment. Or you can choose to obey God, which le leads to righteous living. Self-control is choosing to obey God and live as Jesus lived so that we don't see death, that we don't find eternal separation from the Father. That's what Paul wanted for Felix and Drusilla, and really all those that he shared the gospel with, that these things matter because there is a coming judgment. There is a day when the Lord is going to return. There is a day when we are all going to face him face to face. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, and just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who eagerly await him. As, Christian, as Christians, Judgment Day isn't something that we fret about. It's not something that we worry about, right? Paul writes to the church in Rome in Romans chapter 8. He says, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ, right? Like, we're not going to be judged for the sins of our past. Jesus took those upon himself. When God looks at us, he doesn't see sinners. He sees his son. That's the great exchange that occurred. The day of judgment will come for all of humanity, but when God comes to judge us, he will see that we, we're Jesus, that we look like Jesus, and we will be in, allowed to enter into heaven, not because of anything that we've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done for us. But for those that don't pursue God's righteousness, and don't live righteously, and don't live self-controlled, there's a day of coming judgment that we don't want them to see. A day when those, they will come, they will come face to face with their creator, and then they will spend eternity separated from him. There is a day when Jesus will return. We don't know a lot about it. We're told that Jesus will come like a thief in the night. We're told that it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. 
Paul says that we're not to be ignorant about those that go to sleep, but to know that the Lord is coming back and that we're all going to be called into heaven with him one day. When it happens or what it looks like, it doesn't really matter. But it's not something that we need to be afraid of. It's not something that we should fear. But we shouldn't want any non-believer to know what that's like. When that day comes, we should have worked as hard as we could to share the gospel with as many people as we could so that they don't face that God that judges him out of his presence. That's the message that Paul was speaking to Felix and Drusilla and those that were in his audience at Caesarea. But it's not a message that we need to be afraid of. And it's not a message that those who don't believe need to be afraid of if they place their faith in Jesus. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, and you don't know him um, in that way, then don't let another day go by without accepting him, without saying yes to him, without being buried in those waters of baptism and coming up a new life alive in him, just like we read about in Romans chapter 6. Why would we ever want to meet and, and come face to face with God apart from his son Jesus when he's offered us this free gift, this beautiful life that he's offered us that we can have here and we can have now that will last as we walk all the way into eternity when we know that there's going to be a day. We know there's going to be a day when he comes back and we don't want to be on the wrong side of that trip. Why don't you guys pray with me? Father God, as we come before you this morning, I pray that you open our eyes to see the things that we need to see from your word. As we look at the life of Paul, Father, I pray that we find encouragement on how to live and the way to live, but also this encouragement to share this good news, to be bold and courageous, to not be afraid of what it brings of those that it drives away. But Father, that we would proclaim your good news and just pray for those that would hear it and accept it. And Father, I pray that you would just use us all to help somebody find your son Jesus and come to a saving faith in him so that they don't have to meet judgment. Father, give us just help us to see what it is, even a glimpse of what eternity without you would be like. So that our hearts would just be turned towards you and towards those who don't know you. We thank you for this morning and this time we've had to worship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's a decision that you need to make this morning, if that's a decision that you need to make, we would love to talk to you about that. We'd love to begin to walk through that with you and help you come to that saving faith in him. And uh, you could see Jordan and I afterwards. We'd love to talk with you and, and just set up an appointment or set up a time to share even this morning. Um, but don't let another day go by without coming to that saving faith. As Christians, we come into this next moment and we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And there's trays around the room uh, for you to partake of the emblems this morning to remember what Jesus has done for us. That he did offer us this gift of salvation because of who he is, because of his great love for us, that, that we could have this relationship with him. And we're reminded of what that relationship looks like as we partake of these emblems. We remember that what lengths that he went for us, that his body was, was broken, though he committed no crime, though he had never sinned, he allowed his life to be taken for us and his body broken. And, and the juice uh, reminds us that his blood was shed. Shed is taken from. He didn't go to the you know, blood donor van, you know, bus for uh, the Red Cross, his blood was taken from him violently. And when we see these emblems, it reminds us of, of that Friday. It reminds us of what he went through on the cross for us. 
And, and, I, and I'm, I'm convinced that when he said, do this in remembrance of me, like when you gather together, do this in remembrance of me, he knew that we were going to need this moment, this solemn moment, every time we get together because it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to push to the side. It's, it's easy to, to walk in our faith and, and, and forget where we came from and what he's done for us. And so we partake of these emblems to remind us of that every week, that Jesus died for our sins, that, that he did that on the cross for us. So this morning, there'll be five tables around the room. There's one in this, our, I always feel bad. This is like our um, airline stewardess. Your closest exit may be behind you. Um, there'll be, there's two tables in the back, two tables in the front. We've got a new table up front for those um, that would like to uh, come forward and take it that way as well, especially in this first part. Um, but uh, these, this is a moment for you uh, to just sit with your Savior and just remember what he's done for you. Why don't you pray with me? Father God, we come before you this morning thankful um, that you would go to the cross for us. You willingly went to the cross for us. This was, was the plan that you would come down to save each and every one of us. And as we look at these emblems and we hold these emblems in our hand, we're reminded that it was your body that was actually broken and that it was your blood that was actually shed. And though these elements just represent those things, Father, take us back to that moment as if we were a person in the crowd watching Jesus being beaten and tortured and nailed to that cross and realize that he did that for us. So that we wouldn't face judgment. But that we would begin to walk with you in your presence now into an eternity that will last forever. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to be able to commune together and remember what Jesus has done for us. And we pray this in his name. Amen.